So thank you all so much for joining us today for the first Connecting Communities and Schools webinar of 2023. We are so happy to have you here with us um, to talk about supporting employee wellness. So my name is McLean Gutkin. I am the local wellness policy coordinator at the Medical University of South Carolina in the Boeing Center for Children's Wellness. And I'm joined by my co-host, Erica Ayers, who is the school wellness consultant with the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity Prevention at DHEC. And I am a member of the school's network. And Erica is the executive director of the South Carolina Governor's Council on Physical Fitness. And so the mission of the school's network is to identify and promote healthy eating and active living strategies in South Carolina public schools that empower key stakeholders such as yourselves and encourage collaboration among those seeking to improve student health and academic achievement. Thank you, McLean. Uh, like McLean mentioned, I'm Erica Ayers. I'm the Executive Director for the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness. And the mission of the Governor's Council is to support the health and well-being of all South Carolinians through the advancement of physical activity. Currently, the Council is focused on supporting student health, which is why they now work jointly with the Schools Network. And an example of that collaboration is this webinar series. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. The purpose in this, if you can hear a three-year-old in the background, it's because I'm home alone with a sick three-year-old, so please excuse the noise. I try to lock myself in the bedroom for my two-minute presentation. The purpose in the webinar series is to enhance the collaboration between schools and communities using the whole school, whole community, whole child model as a framework. And why we are doing this on the next slide, today we're talking about staff wellness and Specifically, when you think about schools and staff wellness with the teachers, if they're happy and healthy, they're ready to teach, and they're also ready to serve as positive role models for their students. So next slide, how we do this is we work together. And so the whole school, whole community, whole child model provides a framework for that collaboration between schools and communities across multiple sectors. It places the child or the student in the center, and it takes a comprehensive approach to supporting health and learning. And while the Schools Network and the Governor's Council are focused on healthy eating and active living, we understand that these behaviors align with and impact the other components, such as employee wellness, which is what we'll talk about today. So what does this look like in South Carolina? That's what our panel is going to share with us today. But before McLean introduces them, we're going to open up our first poll because we want them to have a better idea of who y'all are in our audience. Thank you. All right, so the poll results are in. It looks like a little over half of you are school staff or teachers. And then we have about 28% of you are from a state organization. Um, and then a few of you are from community organizations and then the nine uh, percent are other. So thank you so much for sharing. I am very excited to introduce our panel to you today. You will be hearing first from Dr. Aaron Scherder, the mental health project coordinator and colleague of mine at the Medical University of South Carolina's Boeing Center for Children's Wellness. And then we will hear from Christina Cody, a culture of health leader, um, an incredible advocate for health in Cherokee County School District. So before we turn it over to Erin, we have one other poll question for you. Um, so on a scale of one to five, how capable do you feel in prioritizing your own self wellness with one being not at all capable and five being very capable? All righty, so the results are in, and it looks like most of you are at a four, which is great. 25% uh, are at three, 20 are at five, uh, and then just a few at two. So thank you so much for answering that. And Erin, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Thank you, McLean and Erica, for having me today. I'm really excited to share with all of you about some thoughts around wellness for all uh, within this webinar panel, and I hope that we can get everyone to a five today, so or at least move up one point. So if you were at a two, maybe we can move you to a three would be wonderful. Uh, as McLean mentioned, I'm the mental health project coordinator with MUSC Boeing Center for Children's Wellness. Uh, I was originally a school psychologist within Charleston County School District. I worked then as their interconnected systems framework coach, integrating mental health directly into the multi-tiered frameworks in the schools. And I have an advocacy for wellness for all. And I believe that I've done my job when I remind people People to be kind to themselves. So that is what I hope I'm able to share with you today with a little bit of light humor and a little bit of research. Our objectives for today as an educator, I always have to share with you what our objectives are for my section of the panel uh, to understand the why behind our self wellness we will define educator stress specifically. So thinking of educators and the stress that is placed on our workforce, and then we'll review some strategies that work for most. It's not going to be something that works for all. There's not a catch all for wellness. Unfortunately, there's no prescribed um, strategy or plan, but we find what works for most and then we decide what works for us. So why self-wellness? Um, if you've heard of this analogy, we have to first put on our own oxygen mask before assisting or helping others. That comes on every time you get into a plane. It applies as well for self-wellness. Uh, we have to take care of ourselves before we can assist or help others in their own wellness priorities. So thinking of that, it is what we can control. It is where we start. Uh, but that being said, we know that there's a cultural shift or mindset that sometimes we need to focus on as well. But we start here with self-wellness so that we can help ourselves to therefore help others. So let's define stress. There's multiple definitions, but basically stress tells us that it's a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources uh, for their ability to mobilize. So they perceive that the demands that have been placed on them do not, they don't have the resources to be able to respond to said demands. And stress shows up in the body, in the mind, um, outwardly in our physical self, but as well as our relationships with others. So thinking of that within our definition, how do we work on this? Let's define it first so that we can work towards the solution. So why is addressing the problem important? Teachers who experience occupational stress tend to demonstrate a lack of emotional support and negative interactions with their students, as well as producing additional stress for at-risk students. So we know it's important for teachers, for themselves, to address the problem, but also for the students that we support. Uh, and then schools that prioritize the staff wellness uh, demonstrate positive staff interactions, a shared commitment to student success, and increase a sense of overall warmth. So we started with this statistic from Bradshaw as well, just thinking of ways that we can create wellness in general for all staff, whether it's within a school or a community provider, and uh, create a culture that's supportive for wellness. So what's keeping us up at night still? We know that this is important. We know that wellness is important. What do we need to do, right? We need to first look at the problem so that we can define it and move forward. There's a study from Louisiana that said recently that early childhood educators' mental health last spring found that rates of depression almost doubled with more than a third of those educators indicating depressive symptoms. Another study that's really keeping us up at night said that a vast majority of teachers working uh, reported working longer hours, and only a quarter said that their school had adequate support for their mental health. So they're working longer hours. The depressive symptoms, as well as other mental health conditions, have increased, but teachers and educators are feeling that their school is not supporting their mental health. Even though we're having this insurmountable increase, we don't have the needs um, met at all. We know that there's effects of stress. We, we started with a statistic in terms of students and how that impacts our students as well as staff. But we have this thought of stress in general, right? In general, stress uh, can impact our ability to work. We are educators and community providers here. So we have this kind of compassion satisfaction. It's the positive aspect of our caring profession. It feels good to help, right? That's why we're here most of the time. Um, there's values tied into this. 
But unfortunately, that compassion satisfaction can sometimes move into compassion fatigue very easily. And we get those negative aspects of our caring profession, specifically often called burnout or secondary or vicarious trauma when we experience stress on a daily basis and we don't have the, uh, the ability to respond to the demands that are placed on us. I love quotes, so I'll share quite a few with you, but this is my first one. I'll just uh, add some thoughts in here and that loving ourselves is frontline social justice work. There's no need for us to suffer in order to serve. So let's think about getting started. We often see this kind of self-care wheel in terms of balance and finding self-care that works for us. Um, I will say that I often use the term self-wellness because I can't tell you how to care for yourself, but in general, we can support our wellness and thinking about these different domains, right? It's not the same for everyone. Uh, we have different areas of this wellness kind of balance within our circle. We have physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, personal, as well as professional. And what we really want to do is think about how these can vary at different times. So our professional self-wellness may not always be at its top peak or its bucket may not be filled. So can we fill it with another area? Can we think of a physical or an emotional or potentially a psychological, personal, or spiritual bucket that we could fill to help find that balance? Because we want to consider multiple domains for our plan that we're going to talk about today so that we can really support ourselves and find that balance while always balancing. So where do we start? We have to find meaning. Uh, lots of times we, we think about starting with just, okay, let's put some self-care things on our daily schedule and let's just go there. Let's all do yoga. Um, I use yoga as the example because I'm also a yoga instructor. So that's always my first go-to but it is not a one size fits all, right? Just adding yoga to your calendar. Some people, that is not what they wanna do. <laughs> they don't wanna start with yoga uh, ever or end with yoga. And that's not a strategy that's gonna work for them. Um, so really we need to start first by finding meaning. We want to take a step back and think about our values versus our goals. So as educators, as community providers here, uh, we all potentially joined this profession for a reason. We had values that were tied into our work. And lots of times we get lost in the goals. So we get lost in the day-to-day to-do -day to list. I have to do this. I have to do that. And then this next. And it feels very tedious and it piles up very easily. But if we can come back to our values, why did we start here as educators? It makes the tedious to-do list, the emails, the lesson plans, the different note-taking things that we have to do uh, feel less stressful if we can come back to, I have to answer these emails because I need to engage with parents because that is a priority of mine as an educator is to engage parents in the child's education. And so it, it helps us flip the switch a little bit and coming back to finding meaning. So we rediscover our why. We wanna find value. Why did we join the profession that we're in? And what do we value potentially about teaching or education if that's the role that you're in? So I'd love if you could type in the chat box if anybody feels like sharing um, why you joined this profession that you're in potentially as an educator or a community provider here on this webinar today. Why did you join? I'll tell you mine. Uh, I wanted to help students and their families and I also really wanted my summers off. I always say that, but I never got them off. So that <laughs> I always worked through the summers, but that was my original thought. But I wanted to help. So please, if you don't mind to type in the chat box, I'd love just a few. Why did you join the profession that you're in? Coming back to the why. Wanted to make a difference. Better hours. Yeah, the school schedule. Um, wanted to never see a child hungry. Absolutely. Make a difference. Help families with nutritional balance. Thank you, Maggie. Working with students and their families, right? We have a passion for this, for helping, helping kids learn about food. Absolutely, we love kids lots of times. We believe that they're our future. We wanna partner with families to support them. Yes, absolutely. 
Thank you all. I feel like we've got a lot of nutritionalists and dietitians on the call today. I'm so glad to have that perspective. Um, that is a definitely a piece of wellness and self-wellness. Loving students, family advocacy, invest in the future of others. Absolutely. Originally, it was for schedule. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, no, it's because we need to help the kids, right? Absolutely. Um, so thinking of that, coming back to our why really helps make the tedious to-do list tasks and the stress that is placed on the system uh, have a little bit of perspective, right? If we can have some perspective to it and we can come back to our values and our meaning, then lots of times it helps us balance that stress and work-life balance. Thank you all for sharing. So where to start? We have to find our balance, right? We need to find our equilibrium. So thinking of... Um, Intro psychology, I'm also a psychology professor at the College of Charleston, so I like to tie this back into what we teach our intro psych students. And lots of times we talk about the body wanting to be at a homeostatic state, like our body wants to be, if you think about a thermostat, within this set range, right? We are potentially our, our thermostat is 68 to 73, like this one here. Mine would be a little warmer. I like it a little warmer, but we know our set balance, right? Uh, somewhere within there. And if we ever get past that set balance and we get too hot or too cold, the body and the mind really starts to tell us that, right? We have these potential cues or some people call them triggers potentially where we can feel these things that happen within us where our body and mind responds in a different way uh, in the sense that we may lash out at a, a coworker or a student, or we may feel stressed within the body, uh, feel more anxious, uh, these kinds of feelings. And so we know that our, our emotions are telling us we're getting off balance, right? We're not in our homeostatic state, and we need to do something to get back to that. So where to start finding your balance? I always say try to return to your equilibrium. And within the body, there's three ways that Brene Brown and many other researchers say that we need to do this to come back to our balance. Get some sleep, get the right amount of sleep, move our bodies in the right way, whether that's going for a walk or just stretching and then eating well. So we have many nutritionalists and dietitians on the call today. We know how important it is within the mind gut connection to eat well. Finding our balance while always balancing. Another quote, this one is my favorite. Uh, I think about it daily. A gentle reminder for all of you though, Nobody is going to finally give you permission to love your life, your body, your existence on this earth. You do that for you. You don't need permission to enjoy the sunshine on your face, to feel the warm water on your skin, the laugh you make when something catches you off guard. Stop hoarding your joy. You deserve it all. Act accordingly. So if we want to think about ways to promote a culture of self-wellness within ourselves, within our community, we have to first start, we know, with that oxygen mask, so ourselves, and here is some strategies for that. Brene Brown says that clear is kind and unclear is unkind. We have to clearly state our expectations and boundaries with ourselves as well as with others. And sometimes the hardest part is stating those boundaries within ourselves, but starting there, remembering that clear is kind. And then building self-compassion within ourselves. Self-compassion, we want to speak kindly to ourselves. Um, so Dr. Kristen Neff linked here is one of the leaders in self-compassion. And she says that the first thing we have to do is have that kind internal voice, which is really hard to articulate and begin. She gives some strategies linked in here, um, but just first noticing that internal voice and then building ourselves up can help with self-compassion. Uh, and then helping the common humanity. So all of us, lots of times within our professions already do that. We have our values there. So our self-compassion in that area is usually pretty high already. Uh, but then thinking of the next, expressing gratitude. So sharing with someone why you're thankful for them, um, writing a letter, sending a text. I do this with my college students and I have them all take out their phone and send a thank you text to someone and that really just helps us with our own self-compassion because when we express gratitude to others, it really builds ourselves up too. And that self-compassion can help us balance and decrease stress and burnout. And lastly, mindfulness. Um, on the next slide, I have to do a little plug of mindfulness if you don't mind. 
So the definition of mindfulness, we throw this term around a lot and we say, oh, just be more mindful, right? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, but mindfulness, the definition is an awareness of one's internal states and surroundings. So really just tuning in to the self. And this is the definition from the American Psychological Association. I think of mindfulness and whatever gives me pause. So when I feel like I can pause and tune into me, that is when I'm being the most mindful. When my mind is not taken or distracted in other directions um, or thinking about the to-do list, when I can just pause and focus on myself, and what gives us that, right? Uh, for me, it is yoga. For lots of people, it's music or listening to live music or journaling or going for a walk or these different kinds of mindful activities that really just give us pause and let us tune in. Uh, there's reasons for mindfulness and for practicing that and trying to get it into our daily schedule. Uh, well, first of all, it decreases stress, which is what we're talking about today. It reduces our anxiety. So we have less rumination, those thoughts that just won't stop. If anybody like me goes to bed at night and the to-do list just keeps going. Uh, so we have less rumination when we practice mindfulness. It boosts our working memory and our focus, so we're better at our jobs. We have less emotional reactivity, so when things happen, um, with it, when working with students or adults in the buildings, um, we have less emotional reactivity to it. We can take a pause and step back. We increase our cognitive flexibility. It increases our relationship satisfaction, and we have the ability to have more empathy and compassion for others, which is always a goal and uh, lo lots of times gets lost, especially when we begin to experience stress. That's the first one to go. So what are some strategies for self-wellness? Well, first of all, we have to self-assess. We have to know where we're at. So thinking of that wheel and coming back to that, um, what areas are you strong in? What areas would you like to increase your strength in potentially? Or if you're not strong in any of them, let's pick one and move from there, right? So self-assessing first, and then setting some realistic expectations and goals. Um, we know that with, with students as well as ourselves, if I tell you I'm gonna work out every day of the week, I'm not. I'm not going to work out every day of the week. That is an unrealistic expectation for myself. And if I set that bar too high and then I skip it, immediately I'm going to experience failure. And then I'm probably not going to likely jump back on that horse and try again, right? So setting some realistic expectations, potentially working out twice a week. Maybe let's start with one and feel some success and then move from there. We know that things work better when we schedule them. And we also know that uh, self-wellness is increased whenever we have a cue that leads to a routine and eventually we acknowledge that leads to a habit. So an example of this very simple um, process of equaling into a habit is that if I wanted to work out in the morning, I could set my gym clothes out the night before. And then when I wake up in the morning, I have that cue there. If I do that for potentially 21 days, I acknowledge it and reinforce it in myself, check it off the to-do list. You know, potentially I might feel just some internal gratification for doing that, or I might reward myself with something depending on what I like. And then eventually after 21 days, they say that will lead to a habit. The same way with journaling or whatever you're trying to cultivate. We can build in that cue, potentially setting a timer on the phone, make it a routine, acknowledge our success will lead to a habit of this. And then it'll feel like second half. So what's the solution specifically for our educators? Many of us here on this panel are educators. So what do we do? Practice more self-care? Wouldn't that just be nice? Should we have after hours compulsory staff wellness activities? We'll say no, and that's why we'll talk about in the research. Um, should we practice more yoga? Maybe for some of us, but not for everybody. It's not a one size fits all. Should we just be more positive? Wouldn't that be nice, right? Uh, so what's the solution? Because we know lots of times we're told to do things that aren't effective, but what does the research say? Let's talk about that next. If we wanna build a culture of self-wellness, what can we do? Educator wellness research says that individual teacher well-being is best understood as a process that's constructed in relation to the context. So for teachers, that's oftentimes the culture and the environment within the school. If we can increase the climate within the school, we can help support teacher well-being. And although well-intended, 
and I, I am the first one to say that I do this, uh, saying, you should do more yoga. I'll give a class after school. Um, and making people feel that they have to come to that can have a negative effect out, when it's outside of teachers' daily activities within the schools. Um, and they don't feel like they have the ability to say no or potentially it doesn't respect their personal time because we schedule these things outside of the daily workday and it just adds to the workday rather than helping support the wellness throughout the day. So thinking of ways that we can integrate into the school and also offer options. So not just yoga or potentially the next point here, if these efforts aren't a response to um, staff giving feedback on what they would like, then it can also have a negative effect. So if teachers do say, we would like to have yoga after school, can you provide that? Then that is helpful. But if we just offer it and say, oh, I think yoga will help you, we'll do it after school, that it can have a negative effect with anything if we don't have the feedback first on what is effective and we don't listen to our staff and responding appropriately. We want to create a culture of psychological safety. So we want to normalize checking in with others, make mental health safe to talk about. That's one of the things we're doing today is learning with each other, taking mindful pauses throughout the day, um, practicing empathy and perspective taking, and always decreasing workloads. If we're saying yes to something else, what else are we saying no to? So always asking ourselves that. taking a holistic approach to this kind of compassion resilience that we're trying to build within staff. Uh, here's just a very kind of direct table, if you will, of things that work well uh, based off of the research. Encouraging mindfulness, building it into the schedule, celebrating self-care. So sharing as a leader what works for you and then celebrating others um, within their self-care practice, modeling it, Communicating, so creating potentially circles or small groups with active listening to allow for staff to build compassion resilience around mental health and wellness. Allow for pauses, potentially with reset rooms um, or calm rooms or Zen dens. We have an upcoming webinar on that with the Boeing Center for Children's Wellness tomorrow, actually. If you'd like to join, let us know um, on how to set up Zen dens. A working partnership, so having this kind of check-in, check-out with other staff members to see how we're doing, maybe a tap-in, tap-out system when needed. And as always, we can collect some data. So we can do a potential survey that's very, you know, professional quality of life survey is a standardized assessment, or we can just do a temperature check with our staff at any time and say, on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling? Hold up your fingers. And I can notice if anybody's a one or a two, I might need to check in with them after we have this this discussion and thinking of ways that's just a simple way to take in a little bit of temperature check with staff, but it is data as well. Some questions that can inform our database decision making. Let's ask staff, how many of you feel connected? How many of you feel like you can manage your workload? And let's create a percentage of this and then try to increase from there, set some realistic goals. How many of you feel like you have the skills to manage student needs, make our workload manageable? How many of you feel like you have a voice at the table? And how many of you feel appreciated? So those are some very quick questions that can inform our database decisions in creating wellness opportunities for staff. Let's let educators self-select what works for them, not just offer yoga, that's what I wanna do, but have some other options too and allow them to self-select. Here are some options, um, some ideas based on the research that seem to work well, thinking of virtual cooking parties, potentially yoga, uh, community partner education in terms of nourishment, nature tours, virtual travel trips, book clubs, or potentially meditation practice as well and allow staff to self-select what works for them. We're getting to the end of our dailies, some things to do every day. Uh, book in the day, starting with something in terms of belonging, a deep breathing, a collective intention for the day, and then ending the day on a positive note as well. Taking pause throughout the day. Uh, I had a school who did Cafe Thursdays where one, someone, the occupational therapist actually within the school, would just turn the lights off at the end of the day and turn our music on and start our coffee maker. And they called it Cafe Thursdays and the whole school wanted to go there, um, but it was just a place to take a pause. Um, using music as a universal connector is always helpful. And then lastly, using humor in a supportive way. So taking the time to laugh and do that successfully. So I am going to share very quickly on the next slide, a quick video where we can all laugh together. 
I hope you find it as funny as I do. Oh, we're not seeing it. We're seeing the slides still. We're building the suspense. Hold, please. <laughs> I think we're still just viewing the slides. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> oh. Anywho. <laughs> Just a funny aside, panda sneezing. Uh, thank you all. Uh, if you have any questions, my information is coming up on the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more panda videos. Can never stop watching enough of those. Uh, so thank you all. I'll turn it back over to our host. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erin. That video is so sweet. Um, so next, we are going to have Christina Cody from the Cherokee County School District speak to us. Uh, but before we do that, there's going to be one final poll question for you. So on a scale of one to five, how uh, many of you believe your employer prioritizes the health and well-being of the employees, with five being strongly agree? And one being strongly disagree as the, the parameters. So if you could fill that out, please. All righty, so we have most of you at four, 38%, and then uh, almost 30% are neutral. <clears throat> 20% strongly agree, and then we have a few that disagree and strongly agree, so, or uh, disagree. Thank you guys so much for filling that out, and Christina, I'm going to turn it over to you. Right on. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. That's good information. Always a pleasure. Um, so happy to be here. Let me give a little shout out to Beth Berry. She's a rock star. Appreciate all your help. Uh, so Fit Together is the Cherokee County School District Wellness Initiative, and we'll actually be expanding into Union County next school year, so we're excited about that. Uh, Fit Together has three components, Fit to Learn, which focuses on our students, Fit to Serve, which is centered around our staff, and Fit to Prosper, which works collectively within and for our communities in regards to wellness. Uh, we promote and improve access to physical, mental, emotional, social wellness uh, based on the needs of the people we serve. And that's a really important part, uh, component of any wellness initiative is to be sure you ask uh, those that you serve and never fast forward the trust. Um, it's good, good advice I learned along the way. Uh, Fit Together started from a class discussion at Gaffney High School and with some initiative uh, grant funding and um, uh, support with our community partners, we've expanded into the entire district and uh, that's exciting. So it's led and powered by youth and we've been able to build these partnerships to spark that needed change to prioritize uh, wellness. So we've, we've made lots of improvements, um, still a lot of work to do, as you well know. Um, a lot of it is an uphill, uphill road. Our students, just listening to, to their feedback, have always been very vocal that when teachers feel good, they're better teachers. Um, I think we've all had experience with a, a teacher or an educator or a boss that's in a bad mood, just never, never really works out. So uh, next slide. So how we kind of got started on the employee wellness side, uh, a couple of uh, my teacher friends 
And now we're talking about, we only had a couple of gyms in town. They weren't really affordable. Um, we had our families and just all these responsibilities with uh, a teaching career. So we decided in our 30 minute lunch that we would work out on our lunch. We'd wear clothes that we wouldn't have to change into. Um, and we'd bring an easy lunch to eat. So nothing that needed to be heated or anything like that, just a snack. We'd start, we'd hit a 15 minute hard, fast paced workout. And then we scarf down our lunch. Uh, we really loved the fellowship, but we really um, started noticing what better teachers we were in the afternoons where normally your patience starts to lag and your energy starts to lag. And uh, we just kind of talked about how much better we felt. And uh, it actually benefited our afternoon students, uh, our classes there. So we worked physical activity into our classrooms as well. We were letting students lead activities right before tests or lectures when they had to sit still for a little while. And then we were actually convincing other teachers to try it, that they were getting paid to work out on your lunch because you didn't really get a lunch break. Uh, per se, you couldn't leave for lunch. So we had some other teachers join us and we talked about the benefits of, uh, for our students. And my students actually collected academic data because we were in anatomy and physiology. So we were trying this uh, five minute exercise burst with how well we did on test scores and stuff. Of course, it wasn't you know statistically significant um, data because of all the extra variables, but um, it was, we did see a jump that students enjoyed class more. They felt like they could focus better. Um, we did other professional development in schools uh, with other principals promoting what PE teachers have known since the beginning of time. So next slide. We figured out we had all these people um, and in different lunch shifts and things. So we decided to start a power hour. Um, we got some initial funding uh, with MUSC Boeing Center for Children's Wellness uh, with their checklist funds that we were awarded. Some other grants, we did some fundraisers to create this room uh, that a principal let us convert into this gym. And we opened it up to everyone in the district. So it was kind of it was kind of cool because we also let students come after school. So we had scheduled workouts on Tuesdays and Thursdays for one hour after after school, and it was it turned into this awesome outside of class opportunity for students and teachers to build a relationship. And it may be teachers that they didn't necessarily have in class, but when you're struggling together with the cardio and resistance training, you know you create a, a tight bond. Um, and, you know, there's what happens in power hour stays in power hour because sometimes a curse word might might slip out. You know, you had to be careful when you're struggling with the workout. So there was a lot of grace, but also students were learning that they had other teachers and adults that they could go to in the building uh, if they needed something. So building those those relationships. We partnered with uh, other local gyms to negotiate uh, discounted rates for educators. Um, and most of them were on board other than the ones that were like corporate, um, you know, like a franchise. And then later we actually helped some other schools create their own staff workout areas. And that's donating equipment that, you know, is a laundry collector sometimes. Um, but again, the most important piece in creating anything, events, is asking and listening to feedback from your students and staff. So one of my favorite, uh, most rewarding experiences with Power Hour was working with Skyler. Uh, he thrives with cerebral palsy and relies on a motorized wheelchair most days or his wheeled walker. And when he was a senior, he come to Power Hour one day and said that he wanted to be able to walk at graduation with crutches. And he had never really practiced with those. Um, I talked to his, his mom and, and <laughs> his doctor eventually just to make sure that, you know, we were okay, but he wanted to build up his upper body strength and core strength and practice with crutches on multiple surfaces because we had turf at the stadium where they'd be graduating and, and then you walk up to a wood surface. So um, it was really important that we practice there. So I was working more one-on-one -on -one with Skylar, which kind of pulled me away from designing and leading these workouts which actually turned into an amazing opportunity because we had some students that were in there with us that stepped up to lead. And it 
it eventually led them to be more active in the community with wellness initiatives. So it was a beautiful thing, but Scholar worked out all year long. Um, the other students and staff were, were cheering him on the whole time. And on graduation day, he walked across the stage and his entire class, senior class stood up and cheered him on. And I mean, there were tears and it was just, it was awesome. And um, it was awesome to be there. And I think it's always important that employee wellness is, is one piece, but it's not separate from student wellness. It always circles back and it always benefits students. So when students work on goals uh, with adults and, and we're working on the same goals together, that inspiration runs both ways. And it was, it's an awesome experience. So we surveyed our staff as we were developing these things um, just to get ideas. Like, like Aaron was saying, you don't want employee wellness to be a burden on teachers or make people feel like they have to go. So we wanted to be sure we had uh, something for all abilities. Um, you know, our teachers range in ages uh, and they have different abilities and they have limitations. Um, so we wanted to be sure that things were at least throughout the year, there were different opportunities for, for them to be involved. So we surveyed our staff and got ideas from students about challenges. We had a Walktober. We had a resolution solutions. Those involved a couple of different um, challenges. Biggest loser teams, which I kind of like to shy away from weight just because there's, there's a lot going on there with different variables. Um, we used our in-house capacity and talent to host uh, yoga sessions and marathon training programs, whether you really wanted to run a marathon or if you were just struggling in the marathon of life. So um, it was pretty, it was, it was wide open to kind of like what your goals were. Zumba, dance, cardio sessions, and teachers began using their resources during their planning periods. So they would hit the workout room or the power hour room or they'd go walk during their planning periods and, and they'd be working out together. So this helped provide some accountability and what I like to call social fuel, so. Um, in addition to that superhero training that we called it, we decided to uh, dabble into some competitive team sports. And um, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if it's just localized to Cherokee County. Uh, this is the only place I've worked, but um, we were super competitive. Like there were times where I didn't know if I needed to, you know, call in some admins or what, I didn't know, or if I was gonna have to throw down on the, on the kickball field. But um, we pulled together a district team for a county recreation softball tournament that they were doing. It was open to everybody, but these other teams were like church teams that were historically established and like they practiced all the time. So needless to say, our team was like the bad news bears and we got slaughtered. But other than losing, we had such a great time. Uh, we laughed at ourselves, we laughed at each other. Uh, we planned our own district volleyball tournament thinking that you know volleyball would be a little um, less dangerous. Sometimes it wasn't, but it was really, really successful. So each school come up with their own team. And if your school didn't have a team, you could join another school's team. That way, you know, if your, if your school didn't really want to dabble in the volleyball, then you could do something else. We did a kickball uh, tournament in the dead of winter, just because the baseball fields were all reserved in the spring. So it was really, really cold. But what we learned was it was crazy what teams would do and sacrifice to literally win a spray painted golden ball for a trophy. Like it was insane. Uh, luckily we had made plans with HR prior to all these tournaments to make sure to communicate the risk involved and uh, the work, workers comp um, disqualification, like it didn't apply that it was, it was, you were at your playing at your own risk. Cause a lot of us would come to work the next day limping. So, you know, you'd be sore. But it was fun. It was tons of laughing, uh, laughing. And the best part of the team competitions, other than the smack talk, was that the students would stay late after school to watch these, these matches and they cheer on their school or they'd show up to the ball field. Um, so it was, it was funny to see them cheering on their team and, and, and they'd get it going during the day. They talk smack you know, between teachers too. So it was, it was fun. 
So when we had grant funding, um, we were actually funded by America's Promise Alliance to go from just Gaffney High School to expand district wide, which paid uh, me a salary to create student teams in every building. And, and that was very beneficial, but we funded um, a stipend to one of our champion teachers who was already like yoga certified and Zumba certified, Ms. Erin Fox. She was also state teacher of the year in 2018. So she had the talent and the capacity to lead these employee wellness events. Um, super high energy and passionate about wellness. She would schedule uh, two to three after school workouts each week and she would travel to different schools. And you were welcome to go to whatever school she was at. You didn't have to like wait for her to come to your school. It was open district wide. Um, so she would do zombie runs, um, Halloween Zumba, stretcher skeleton yoga, cardio activities, hit uh, a running club. So whatever you, if you didn't want to participate that day, she was very um, intentional about letting people know what was going to be going on that day. And you could choose to go or not. And students were always invited. And then teachers, uh, teachers, children or admins children would stay and work out too. So you're getting that family component of being active together. And the three words I hate the most, and then COVID. Um, so when schools closed, we were all in shock with a side of fear of the unknown. Uh, our Fit to Serve champion is Erin Fox. She led hour long workouts on Facebook Live and Zoom four days a week. And you can see that collection on the slide there, as well as recording the sessions and emailing them to staff so that it kind of kept people active um you couldn't go to the gym you couldn't go anywhere um you know and she would she'd be outside some days and just always just speaking positivity and and trying to stay upbeat um for our staff and, and providing that piece that that we really couldn't get together anymore and that was hard when schools closed my biggest concern was feeding students we have about an 84 percent free and reduced lunch um status and students rely on school for meals so our amazing community team jumped right into their operation summer feeding. Um, but, and we organized a team of staff members to work in cafeterias, to ride buses, to partner with our Meals on Wheels, to deliver meals to student homes that didn't have transportation. Those same volunteers that showed up were the staff members that have been highly engaged with our employee wellness initiative since we started. Um, I can't tell you, what a joy it was to just feel like in a time where you felt scared and, and hopeless, you know, you had all these people just show up for our, for our kids in a different capacity and, and really putting themselves at risk uh, in the pandemic to make sure that, that students were fed. And our cafeteria staff, nutrition staff were, were incredible in just pivoting every day, every day. So when schools opened back up, COVID risk and restrictions um, and modified schedules just didn't allow for in-person events or school visitors. And it really slowed our momentum that we had going. So next slide, please. And there's a little video clip at the top. This is what I channel a lot since, since COVID. Same five questions you can ask. Okay. Holy Spirit, activate. Oh no. Holy oh, Spirit, no. Oh, activate. No. Holy Spirit, activate. 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 <laughs> All right, let's go. Eleven years. Is yes. So lots of calling on the Holy Spirit, but also realizing that we have to have a holistic approach to to wellness. Um, you know, COVID provided a lot of. Um, challenges and opportunities and so really trying to focus in on what do our staff need now um, and in this in this pandemic and in this recovery and in this grief um, what do we need now so it's a it's a constant ask so gearing back up full speed this year finally uh, we just completed the winter is coming challenge so participants would complete all or part of a 50-day challenge it consisted of 100 push-ups a day, 100 squats per day, and or 100 miles over the course of the challenge. 
So you could do all or part, whichever one you felt comfortable with doing. Um, we got lots of emails about how sitting on the toilet in the morning was a little more difficult with all those squats and my shoulders are killing me. Um, but it really was a camaraderie and we tracked it on a, a Google spreadsheet where you could kind of uh, keep up with other people and challenge your friends. And this was actually the, uh, an idea of one of our history teachers, Will DeBoard, to motivate folks to start on those fitness goals before January. Um, so he's, he's just, you know, finding a team member that has a, a passion and the capacity and really just supporting them. So it makes, makes my job easier. Um, and, and then it lets other people uh, use their leadership skills to, to help everybody else. So we opened it up to the community as well. After some showed interest seeing social media posts, uh, we had a Canvas course. We use Canvas here as our learning management system. And um, they logged it there and we had discussions and, and then we celebrated at the end and everybody got a free t-shirt um, that signed up. So we also used it as a fundraiser. You could donate. Um, we had a fellow colleague that was suddenly diagnosed with kidney cancer and had both kidneys removed within a week. Um, he's a very young, young guy on our staff. And um, so we were able to also raise about $2,000 for him and his family. And his wife is a teacher in our district as well. We have also added, mostly for our students, but licensed clinical therapists, our goal is to get one in every single school. And with the short staffing of Department of Mental Health, you know, they help as much as they can. We've reached out to uh, private practices and they are sending a therapist to the school every single day. And they're building their caseloads to serve our students. But we also make it clear that our staff members can also see that person during the day if needed. And I think that's, that's really important, particularly with, with grief. Um, Cherokee County has a high youth suicide rate. It's something that we have really shift from, you know, healthy eating and active living, that's really important, but we have a serious need um, for mental health right now, um, as um, you, know, you see across, across the state and across the country as we, as we go through this healing process. So um, right now we're in the midst of a 21 day challenge. You know, Aaron was talking about the 21 day habit, but it's something different every day. And it's to, to give you something to try that you may not have thought of. So you try it out, if you like it, you try to do it every day. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, and it ranges from today is like, make yourself laugh. So I'm gonna be posting up funny videos, kind of like Aaron was saying, laughing, um, to getting in 15,000 steps or drinking uh, 64 to 75 ounces of water a day um, to even don't forget to floss and taking time to write a thank you note, like Aaron said, all that is just super important on a holistic term that, that really, that really supports all parts of wellness. So that's fun. Um, some things we have on deck for warmer weather uh, are a beach volleyball tournament. So we wrote a grant, our students wanted a beach volleyball court at one of the schools that didn't have any equipment. So we're gonna use that and have a beach volleyball tournament. Uh, wiffle ball has been requested. So I'm excited about that. Uh, one thing that we're starting up since you know, the feels like there's this whole piece of negativity surrounding the education sector. We're going to host uh, virtual happy hours uh, in the evenings, and they're going to be called Gripe to Growth. So it, it allows you to gripe about, you know, things that you're struggling with, um, but also see where you can make a change, uh, you can make a difference and have some positive, um, you know, really framing challenges as opportunities. Um, and sometimes it's at a different level that we can't control, like at a leadership. And then sometimes it's actually within us. And, and so being able to, to kind of work through those are fun. Um, that kickball is definitely one that wants to come back. Um, I've heard requests for that. And then at the end of the year, I got it approved before COVID and we didn't get to do it, but it's a smash event. So I have, a, I have a company that's gonna bring out an old car and a washing machine and a refrigerator. And we're just gonna get some sledgehammers and some safety glasses. And you're just gonna get to smash stuff. 
um you know some people that's not their thing and then some people like me you know i like to hit stuff but not people so i like kickboxing and boxing to work out um and i have some friends that really need to hit some stuff um so i'm excited about that hopefully we get to um to get that done so that's at the end of the year to just kind of like you know we've been through the struggle and we're gonna tear this up get it all out and we'll we'll just let it go uh, and I'd like to put out if any district that's nearby geographically to Cherokee County in the upstate would like to work on a multi-county tournament or challenge, let me know, because I think that would be kind of fun to challenge other districts or, you know, have away games. It might be fun, but we maybe we could plan something together. So if you're interested in that, put it in the chat and my email will be on the, the last slide. So making employee wellness, like Erin said, it's, it can't be something that's a burden. It's got to be just access to opportunities and, and asking what people are interested in and being able to, to listen and put that into place. And of course, involving uh, students. I think it's, it's really, it was, it's a magical thing. And just being able to see that um, has been, has been very rewarding and it and they take it home to their families so making employee wellness a priority it falters a it sorry fosters a culture of camaraderie and it makes people want to be on the team and research shows that most people weigh their value in the workplace over their salary and you know i talk to some teachers at different schools that's really you know i listen all the time and i ask questions and you know a lot of our teachers if you look at, around the state and the, and, and educators and nurses, good gosh, you guys come through COVID. Um, you know, people aren't feeling valued as people and, and that's, that's hurting us. So forget, you know, trying to find more money. I mean, that's important too, but really if you enjoy your job, if you like coming to work, everybody wins, everybody wins. And it's gotta be adopted and, uh, and adapted into the day to day. And that comes from leadership really. So when those bosses, they kind of set the tone. Um, so please ask and listen, find your wellness champions that just love wellness all together and believe in it. Find your talented folks with the capacity. Don't be intimidated by them, use them, support them, turn them loose. And um, definitely uh, reach out to, to me if, if you wanna play um, or if you need help, uh, if you want some ideas, um, okay, I see some chat. You want the 21 day challenge? We're on day 15 right now, um, but I'll type up a quick list or I can send you um, uh, uh, ping files and you can alter it to be yourself, a PDF, that'd be great. And uh, you can use them on your own. So it's, it, it's a cool little, just for people to try different things, but feel free to reach out to me and you know you got to take care of yourself so so you can take care of each other and and that's the most important part and Erin talked about boundary settings and I'm a yes woman so I'm having to learn a lot of that too so it's a it's a constant it's a constant um, journey for sure Thank you so much, Christina. That was a fabulous presentation. And I'd like to thank both our panelists, um, Aaron and Christina Cody, for sharing your, expect, um, your expertise with us today and your thoughts on staff wellness. And I could definitely speak for myself learning a lot um, and just truly touched by, by your stories, Cody. They were, they were fantastic to see what's happening in Cherokee County. Um, so everyone, the panelist information is there um, on the screen if you'd like to email them. And for those of you with any questions, if you want to type them in the chat or put them in the Q&A now, that would be fantastic. Um, and if you don't have any questions, this webinar recording will be sent out. So if you want to share it with your team uh, and get some get some sports teams started at your schools or take any of these ideas with you. That would be wonderful. 
JC, if you'll go to the next slide before everyone pops off, just to give them a reminder of our upcoming webinars. And then please excuse the small font. Yes, so if you all would like to join us next month, February 15th, we'll be talking about providing health education and supporting social emotional wellness with some different speakers. So you see the registration link there. Um, and we also have to save the dates for the rest of the webinars we'll be hosting this year, March 15th, May 19th, and May 17th. So please feel free to register and share those uh, across your networks. Um, and if there are no questions, we'd just like to thank you again for joining us. And a huge thank you to Aaron and Christina Cody.